uh, I have the greatest respect for Amos, and I, I tease him all the time. And uh, this, and I certainly appreciate uh, him taking on a uh, very tough question. I think that uh, anybody uh, in this field has to uh, give some credence to the idea that there's a need for intelligence protection. And I certainly subscribe to the idea that uh, uh, we cannot continue to uh, hold detainees without trial. Now, where I disagree is for the motivation. I understand that it is unconstitutional, but that really does not concern me. So let me just I'll get to my reaction to the National Security Court, but I want to make a point about why I disagree with the way the detainees are being held. Uh, I'm not so guided by the principle that uh, they should not be held uh, endlessly because it is unconstitutional because I, I think that when you get into constitutional debate there are a number in, in the doctrine of necessity there are a number of legal arguments that can be made. But from a practical sense, I'm concerned again about the, the conditions on the ground that are facilitated uh, when we have a system wherein we hold people and perhaps torture people and without any end in sight. I'm convinced that if a operator is on the ground and there is someone who is uh, about to be arrested or about to be detained and there's a choice between that person killing themselves and killing that soldier uh, uh, in, a, in that exchange or surrendering, I believe that the person who believes that when they see that American flag on the, on the shoulder of a soldier is more likely to surrender if they believe that they will give it, be given a fair chance to defend themselves and would be part of a system that believes in the acquisition, acquisition of justice and truth. And I believe that that ultimately will lead to uh, 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 us saving more lives on, on, on the battlefield. So for, practic for those practical reasons, uh, I, 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 I denounce any ideas by which uh, we take people from the battlefield and hold them uh, indefinitely and subject them to torture uh, because I want to see more surrenders and I definitely believe that uh, it may help us in the areas of reciprocity in the event that our soldiers are taken. Now, back to the National Security Court. Now, there are some, I'm a little confused about many things concerning the National Security Court. But I, I do think that uh, 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 if, if there's a choice between the National Security Court and the military commissions, I will go with the military commissions. I think where the military commissions has advantages is that you have security cleared counsel, you have security cleared uh, panel members, you have security cleared uh, uh, staff members. There's not a requirement for disclosures as it is in Article 3 courts. Uh, but there are some fundamental disadvantages like a lack of oversight and susceptibility to undue influence and I'm not so certain that the National Security Court would, would uh, uh, eradicate those, those disadvantages. Also, uh, I don't know who or by what, how we will have personal jurisdiction or subject matter jurisdiction inside a national security court. I think that we will have to, uh, and I think this is what uh, Gabor was getting at, uh, I think we will have to uh, more accurately define who would go before that court, by what, by what mechanism would personal jurisdiction be triggered, and what crimes would be covered by it. And I, I'm, I don't know that we have a satisfactory answer to, to that. So uh, okay. that's where I stand on. Gabor, how about you? I mean, you, uh, do you accept the premise that we can't try terrorists in federal court? <laughs> oh, it looks like you don't. <laughs> um, this is a uh, study that um, Human Rights First, my organization, commissioned. <coughs> uh, and it was written by two former federal prosecutors. Uh, what they did, it's really, I think, a, a miraculously comprehensive um, study that they did of approximately <clears throat> 120 cases of what they called jihadist terrorism uh, cases in the federal criminal justice system in the U.S. Uh, a few of those cases pre-9-11, the vast majority of them post-9-11. They went through the charges, they went through the procedures, they went through the conclusions of those trials, they went through the problems that have been um, 
concurrent in, in many criminal trials involving charges of terrorism, such as the use of national security, classified information, um, the question of whether the, the scope of crimes uh, that are available to be charged is sufficiently broad uh, to cover the universe of people that would uh, that the U.S. would want to um, subject to uh, to criminal process. Uh, detailed issues such as uh, chain of custody problems, questions about the application of Miranda warnings, the safety and security of judges and and juries. Um, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, the, um, the conclusions that, I, that they drew and, and that I think are inevitable is that the criminal justice system is perfectly adequate to try individuals um, that are suspected of involvement in terrorism. And this is not to say that criminal prosecution is the be-all and end-all answer of the problem of terrorism. There's a place for military action, there's a place for diplomacy, there's a place for, um, f for intelligence gathering that is quite separate from, uh, from prosecution. Um, there's a place for economic sanctions. There, there's a, a, you know, a, a large spectrum, a broad spectrum of tools that a state has available and has to have available in order to deal with the problem of international terrorism. However, when it comes to accountability, when it comes to taking terrorists off the streets and putting them out of commission, the experience of the criminal justice system, I think, shows that it is perfectly adequate to handle the cases that are brought before it. And in fact, that's a criticism of those who would like to see and feel the need for something other than the, than the criminal justice system to try terrorists. The idea that it's been successful in connection with the cases brought before it. That's a caveat. And I think the argument is that, well, what about all the cases that haven't been brought before it? Now, there may very well be individuals that for some reason or other cannot be tried um, either because of a lack of evidence, perhaps because of the methods that have been used to, to gather confessions, um, or perhaps because of the sensitivity of intelligence gathering methods and the lack of desire on the part of government authorities to, to bring those kinds of pieces of evidence um, into the public purview in a public trial. But there again, the criminal justice system has the, util has the use of a Classified Information Procedures Act, um, which contains a number of methodologies for the government to be able to protect national security information while at the same time uh, preserving the right of the defendant to, uh, to a fair trial, to be able to confront um, evidence.